but it's very freeing to know you don't have to try to fix your spouse to read this book and be blessed by it and benefit from it. This is really going to be a transformation for you. You're going to learn to be more calm and peaceful and to say things that are good and right and true and to do things that are going to help your relationship. And the goal hopefully is that your spouse will be impacted by that and join you. As a young mother, I experienced a paradigm shift that transformed how I saw education and ultimately the world around me. I started this podcast, The Luminous Mind, to connect with and learn from people who are disrupting the status quo in how they learn, educate, and live in the world around them. Prepare for a paradigm shift. Light a candle, light your world. Benjamin Franklin said, instead of cursing the darkness, light a candle. You're listening to The Luminous Mind with your host, Rebecca Bowman. Today's fire starter is Amber Leah. A former high school English teacher, Amber is a work-at-home mom of four little boys ranging from 3 to 13. She's the best-selling co-author of Triggers, Exchanging Parents' Angry Reactions for Gentle Biblical Responses and Parenting Scripts. When what you say isn't working, say something new. She and her husband, Guy, own Storehouse Media Group, a faith-friendly and family-friendly TV and film production company in Los Angeles, California. Their book, Marriage Triggers, was released in January of 2020, when she's not building sandcastles with her boys on the beach or searching for Nerf darts all over her house, you can find Amber writing to encourage families on her blog at motherofnights.com. Welcome, Amber. Hey, Rebecca. Thank you for having me. <laughs> I'm so excited to have you back on our podcast. If our audience remembers, Amber Leah was episode 214, Helping Us Parent Gently. It was the title mm -hmm. of the podcast that we did before. And so this is fun. We're going to talk about Amber's new book that she has out, Marriage Triggers, written with your husband, which is amazing. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, just refresh our audience's memory about who you are and some of those, you know, just give us some background into that. Maybe you're up to something new that we don't know about. <laughs> yeah, sure. Definitely. Well, um, so my husband and I, we, we do own a production company, a family and faith friendly production company in Los Angeles. And so we never intended to write books together. <laughs> so that was a big <laughs> new adventure for us writing a book together, though we have done a lot of things in partnership with each other. So it, it did make sense in that sense. But, um, you know, I think a lot of us have had an interesting year this year and a lot of <laughs> things probably feel very new and different, just having kids home from school and, and all of those types of situations. But Guy and I have been really busy developing projects in TV and film and just sort of waiting for the industry to open back up again. So um, things are just been a little bit on pause. So it's been kind of nice actually to just relax a little bit and um, take a minute to survey the surroundings of our family and our home and our relationships that we're closest to and enjoying that. But Guy and I have also this year, since we talked, Guy and I have lost 120 pounds. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Um, 60 pounds each. And we've started doing health coaching and I'm starting to write in that space a little bit more now too. It's been such a huge lifestyle change for us. So that's something new that we've been up to together as well and has had a positive impact on our kids too. That's so, awesome. Yeah. Well, sometime I'd love to talk to you about that, that topic too, because yeah, it's such a good topic for yeah. so many of us right now. Yeah. Well, and um, you know, with the coronavirus, that's one of the things that they say to keep your immune system high and carrying extra weight actually helps yeah. to lower that immune system. It so does. super yeah, it's really topic. dangerous. Yeah the, yeah. the more overweight and just the obesity that we struggle with in, in our culture is really impacts us. And I, I've definitely learned too, that when you're living a healthy lifestyle and you're in a healthy weight, it also empowers you with your own, just your emotions and your spiritual growth and everything else too. They're not just separate things, the physical from the spiritual, emotional, right? We're so, exactly. it's so connected. So it's been really good for us. Yeah. Yeah. And then uh, obviously too, it helps with those marriages <laughs> when, it does. when we uh, feel healthier too. So that's awesome. Absolutely. Yeah. 
Well, I'd love to understand the background to why you wrote the book Marriage Triggers. Um, you said that you and Guy never pictured yourselves writing books together, but so what was the, you know, the idea behind that and how did that start? Yeah, great question. So Guy and I, we definitely, you know, he's always wanted to write a book. I think a lot of people want to write a book and it's a, it's a whole other thing to actually sit down and do it. It, it is a big undertaking. I always want anybody who has an idea and has a dream to write a book, I think they should write a book. <laughs> I think more people should write books. We, we have lots of books in the world, but we need more. And so there was that little bit of a desire on his part, but it was nothing he was actively pursuing. And we certainly didn't think about doing it together. But in writing Parenting Triggers with my co-author, Wendy Speak, and our other follow-up books, The Study Guide and Parenting Scripts, we would go to different places all around the country and speak. And we do a lot of um, podcasts and radio shows and we talk with readers all the time. And one of the things that people would say to us was, this has been so helpful in my life uh, as a parent, or I, I see that it's actually helping me in other areas of my relationships with other people too. But I wish there was something really specific for my marriage because this is another area of struggle mm -hmm. for me. And that was true for me. I identified with that because I wasn't just an angry mom. I was an angry wife too. And Guy and I had a lot of struggles early on for many years, too many years. And we allowed the Lord into our marriage relationship in a way that really transformed it. And it was for us a very personal um, struggle and subject. And we recognized we weren't the only ones, just like I recognized, you know, I wasn't the only one who struggled with parenting either. And so the idea early on was sort of at the back of my mind about writing marriage triggers, but I wasn't eager to do so because it's hard. It's a vulnerable thing. <laughs> it's a transparent yeah. thing. And it's also a lot of um, just spiritual battle to write a book like this because it's not just me sitting down and writing out some ideas. Like everything I write is deeply meaningful to me. And I'm picturing always the reader that I really love and care about before me as I'm writing. And so it's a, it's a very big emotional undertaking. And this topic is so tender I think yeah. for so many people that I wanted to handle it well. So I didn't just enter into it like, oh, this should just be the next book I write. Like I really wanted it to be what God wanted us to do. And I wanted it to be done with excellence. And so we took a couple years to think about it and pray about it and listen to our readers and interviewed hundreds of people. And then we just started um, sensing that now was the time. So I asked Guy, I said, look, I could do this on my own but it doesn't make much sense. Like I, I think it's, we're stronger as a couple, right? In our marriages, we're a couple. And so it makes most sense to me if you would write this book with me and he was totally on board. So we well, wrote this book and here we are. Well, and like you said, the vulnerable part of it, that's what one thing I really loved about the book. And I can't imagine writing this book with my spouse because you touch on, like really sensitive areas, parts that maybe it would be really difficult to talk about as, um, you know, uh, as a married couple and then yes. want to express that to other people. Right. Um, one of the things that I really love about your book is that you, just like in parenting scripts and in triggered those angry reactions, changes for parents with angry reactions. One of the things that I love is that you actually write out kind of scripts of what to say. I think this is just a timely message. I mean, especially with coronavirus, I don't know if, you know, being together too much and then not right. dealing with our stuff is is causing more problems. I've seen that happen. So I, I just think, you know, I, I remember being a young college student and I was living with a lady. I moved to Seattle for a little while and lived with a divorce lady up there. And I remember her talking about some of the things that caused the divorce. One of them was like, she didn't clean the toilet well mm. enough. And mm. at the time I remember yes. thinking, well, that's so silly. But now being married, I can see that those tiny little things, um, that's right. you know, trigger us to possibly end our marriage. And that's yes. one thing that I love. There are many things in here. You have internal triggers, external triggers, and some of them are things that maybe kind of seem like kind of silly. Like I was reading to my husband about being a backseat driver and he's mm -hmm. like, well, how would that affect your marriage? <laughs> but mm -hmm. it might, you know, it mm -hmm. might. And those tiny little triggers that we don't talk about can be huge in a marriage. So just to plug yes. the book of kind of what it's like, 
Um, but I'd love yeah. for you to tell me, you know, you said that you talked with a lot of different people. Tell me, like, what did you discover while you were researching this book? And how did the, your own marriage experience help to contribute to that research? Yeah, well, you're right on, Rebecca, in what you just said, that it's often those little things that add up to create a tone and an environment in your relationship that is less than its best. Yeah. <laughs> and it's not often the big issue like the extramarital affair, which we discuss some of those things in the book as well. But in all of our conversations with other couples, but also even just our own experience over, we're coming up on our 15th year of marriage with four kids. And these are the things that really were kind of make or break issues in our own relationship. And we found that we had a lot of them in common with our, with our readers when we were talking with them. And so I think most couples, you know, there are going to be extreme situations where there's a marriage that's in severe crisis and that needs professional help probably, right? Some counseling, mm -hmm. some insight from pastors, some things like that. But for a lot of us as couples, we just feel dissatisfied in our relationship. We know there's room for improvement. We do struggle with anger and frustration. We're committed, but we still are hurting because the marriage is, isn't what we want it to be. And it's often those things like not cleaning the toilet or the way that somebody nags you in the car when you're driving. It's those things that steal the joy and the love and the friendship from our relationships. And so we wanted this book to be really different and unique. And we think that it is because it goes over what to do and say in those everyday moments. There's 31 of them in the book. And we really carefully go through to actually you know, give some biblical insight into those things and why we respond the way that we do. Because really one of the foundations of the book is that being proactive in our marriage prevents us from being reactive in our marriages. And so what happens with most couples is every time we get in the car, we bicker again. Or every time we go into the bathroom and it's not cleaned, you know, then there's a problem. Or you come home from work and the house is a mess and you can't understand why. Or you told your spouse that this bill was coming and they didn't take care of it. Or, you know, you are a total morning person and you get up and you're happy to start the day and your spouse is not a morning person. They have a different personality and you just butt heads. You know, all these quote unquote little things that just cycle one day looks like the next and the next and the next. And we're not proactive to say, hey, maybe we actually should address this issue, even though it's seemingly small and communicate better and then make a plan so that we're proactive in not allowing these little things to add up and have a big impact on the health of our marriage. And so that's what we try to help people do little by little through each of these chapters is give them some things that they can say and do specifically that will help them move in a more positive direction and be more proactive so that we're not just reactive all the time when a trigger comes up. We can learn also to respond differently when those triggers do show up in our lives. We know a different way, a better way to communicate and to put a plan in place. That's awesome. Well, and I'd love to know, like, how did you decide to select the triggers that you did? Was that from like personal experience or different things that, you know, you had heard from your readers? Things like yeah. That? So I started taking notes really over the course of a couple of years. I have a, a document in my computer and I have some documents on my phone where as conversations are happening with friends, with family, with readers, um, people will write to me on a regular basis. I answer every letter. I read every letter. I answer every letter. Mm -hmm. And they're often sharing with me, you know, their heart and their, their sorrows in their marriage, their prayer requests for their marriage. And I often will just dig a little deeper and just ask them a few more clarifying questions. And so for a long time, I've been able to really get to what I think were some of the most common issues that couples struggle with. Mm -hmm. And so we just started making a list and some of them kind of fell into the similar category, you know, and, and so there were all these different issues. Some of the, are the big common ones that most people would recognize like finances or personality differences or communication styles, those kinds of things. But then the things like being a backseat driver, um, you know, is definitely mm -hmm. one that was a very common issue. And yet it's not something that I'd ever read about in a marriage book before. You know, we, we talk about having an emotional affair and what that looks like. It, it's kind of different than, a, uh, you know, an actual physical relationship with somebody else. Sometimes one of the things that's a struggle for a lot of Christian families is we feel like our spouse is not a spiritual leader 
or we just have different goals for ourselves spiritually. Maybe your relationship with God looks very different from your spouse. And we don't realize that we're being you know, critical or judgmental or that there's a sorrow there or that we need to communicate about that. So these are just all the things that we gathered by having lots of interviews. We had lots of conversations with couples over the last couple of years, and then also our own personal experiences too. It's kind of a combination. Yeah. And I think, you know, when I was looking through before I started reading, and hopefully this doesn't sound horrible, but I was like, uh, these are strange things to talk about. But the funny thing is, is when I was reading, especially like the backseat driver and, and things like that, I really did find like, wow, you know, I didn't really realize that I was doing this or, or that that was bothering me type of thing until we read these marriage triggers. And that's another positive thing I think about your book is that sometimes we don't recognize. And, you know, when you talk about the extramarital affair or even the emotional affair that somebody might have, it may come because we don't recognize these triggers that's within right. our our own relationship. Yes. And if we don't, like you said, address those, that it can grow into something bigger. I have a lot of friends that have had, you know, experience with extramarital affairs. And that's what they mentioned that, you know, it grew out of other things. That's um, right. And if we yeah. think that it just happens one day, it doesn't, there's that's other right. things that happen for sure. Yeah, exactly. And so we, you know, Guy and I, we're really passionate about trying to help couples. I mean, and, and our books, all of my books, this one is no different. They're really coming from people who love God, but also just are really in the trenches ourselves. Like mm -hmm. we're not writing from a perspective of we've totally arrived and we have no problems and we cannot relate to you. <laughs> <laughs> um, we write from a place of we are still in process as well. We know that this is the path that we're supposed to be on and we're still walking it. And we invite our readers to walk that path with us toward hope and reconciliation and better communication and working on all of these things that do set us up for those bigger issues that we really want to protect couples from. And so we're hopeful that, like you said, as people read through, they may not think initially that this chapter applies to them, but our prayer really was that, that everybody who's reading would really draw some significant just wisdom and encouragement from every single one of these short 31 chapters as they go through. And ideally, it's good to do this with your spouse, but we also wanted people to feel like, you know, maybe you're the one who's trying and it doesn't seem like your spouse is interested in moving in the right direction. There's a lot of hope in here for that person too, for that spouse, because we believe that ultimately any transformation that happens in your marriage, you cannot help or change your spouse. Ultimately, you can't change your spouse. It has to come from them and from God. And so in the midst of that, though, there's so much that we do that does influence our spouse. Even though we can't change them, we can influence them. But more importantly, it's so helpful and freeing to know that my spouse's sin, my spouse's issues, they are not justification for my own issues <laughs> or sinful behavior. Like, even if my spouse is not on board with me yet, even if I'm the only one who's trying to read through this book and apply what it's teaching and work on my own reactions in anger and frustration toward my spouse, that is going to have a profound impact on our relationship. But it's very freeing to know you don't have to try to fix your spouse to read this book and be blessed by it and benefit from it. This is really going to be a transformation for you. You're going to learn to be more calm and peaceful and to say things that are good and right and true, and to do things that are going to help your relationship. And the goal, hopefully, is that your spouse will be impacted by that and join you. But we think that this book is really, really important for giving hope to every kind of couple, you know, that whether you're together wanting to be a team and you both want to try to grow more, or even if it's just one of you initially. Well, and that's one thing that I really did love about this book, another, another thing. Uh, and I was trying to look through to see if I could find an example of it. But there were issues like, you know, when you begin reading, you, you may think, oh, this is a problem that my spouse may have. But I love how you reframed it of like, what are some things that you're doing that might be affecting, you know, this situation? And 
that was one thing that uh, at least I drew from it. And maybe that was just kind of going on in my own head. <laughs> that I was yeah, like, no, I think okay. you're right. <laughs> for, a lot of pe- for a lot of people, I think that's true. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, and I remember a few years ago, I had a niece approach me and she had been divorced and back again to that vulnerability piece. And you know, we were discussing maybe issues within the marriage and why it dissolved type of thing. And, and I was like, well, yeah, I've had that situation in our own marriage. And, and sometimes when marriages stay intact, people think that those marriages are perfect and that mm-hmm. um, there's no, you know, people that are struggling don't have the, the relatability or that they can't see the, the problems because we all put on a nice face, right? Right. Um, and that's what I loved about the vulnerability of that book is that it shows like, no, we're all struggling with these things in our marriage, but these are ways that we've handled or been able to maneuver that kind of situation. Do you feel like maybe there are some challenges that you see? I mean, you have 31 of them, of course, but maybe like some that you see more pronounced than other challenges that people might have in marriages. Yeah, I think in in general, there's sort of another like underlying issue that we hope to open people's eyes to when they're reading. And that is that a lot of us, we recognize hopefully that we're part of the issue, right? Like we're humble enough to recognize it takes two for there to be some problems. But at the same time, we do get sort of stuck on thinking, gosh, if this would just change or if that thing that my spouse does or doesn't do would change, it would be so much better. And that might be true. Our spouses can make it easier or harder for us to have right responses, right? We can have a right response, whatever they're doing, that doesn't change, but they can make it harder or easier for us to do that. (laughs) But one of the things that we focused on in this book throughout, even though we're going to address very specific triggers and give you practical things is this sort of idea that go into your marriage not thinking about your spouse and what they do or do not do to contribute. But instead, there's a verse, Proverbs eleven twenty five 25, that says, whoever brings blessing will be enriched and one who waters will himself be watered. So oh, if you cool. think about that for a minute, like go into your marriage, go into reading this book, humbly being receptive to what can I do to be better and to do better and to speak better regardless of my spouse, what is it that I can do to be a blessing to my spouse? And it doesn't mean my spouse deserves it, quote unquote. That's grace, giving somebody what they don't deserve. But what can I do for my spouse to be a blessing to them? Even when these little things come up, even when they keep telling me to turn left instead of right when we're in the car and asking me to slow down and to have more room between the cars, like how can I be a blessing to them even when they're being a backseat driver, instead of just reacting and getting frustrated and saying, fine, you drive, pull over, you know, like, is there a better way to handle that? How can I be a blessing to my spouse? And then this idea of one who waters will himself be watered. It doesn't say that if you water, which water is life-giving, right? It's refreshing. It brings life. It's a positive element, this idea of watering something and giving it life. So when you water your spouse figuratively by being a blessing to them, by breathing life into them, by speaking to them kindly, by being patient with them when they're testy, by living out the fruit of the spirit, even if they're not, like in those moments when you are quote unquote watering your spouse, it says the one who waters will himself be watered. So it doesn't mean that your spouse is going to water you. It's the action of you watering your spouse that's Mm -hmm. going to have you to have life. And I think that's what we're all looking for when we're trying to resolve our marriage triggers. What we really want is to feel internally at peace and hopeful and happy and loved and loving and refreshed. That's what we're looking for. And we think it's our spouse that's going to do that for us. And in some ways that is true. But foundationally and ultimately, it's actually the act of selflessness and looking for ways to be a blessing to your spouse that's going to give you that lasting root of the kind of emotion and relationship that you're really looking for. It comes from the act of being selfless towards your spouse. And we're not ever advocating abuse or tolerating blindly problems and issues or sinfulness or whatever in your marriage. We're not advocating that. But most of us know there's those little things that, you know, little offenses we could overlook, different kinds of ways that we could respond to our spouse when we feel triggered. That would definitely be a blessing to them 
but ultimately is going to be a bigger blessing to ourselves. Yeah. Well, I was thinking about, you know, when we water, uh, we will be watered. It's kind of like service, you know, when we give people service, a lot of times we go in and we're kind of regret, we're, we're not excited about it initially. Right. Maybe we have other things we need to do, but as we get into the service, we really find that we gain so much out of that experience. And I think it's much the same way when we read a book like this, that we're trying to make, uh, you know, we come into it without humility, like you said, like, okay, what can I learn from this? And just that act of wanting to do better and be better, I think, like you said, it will enrich and be a better part of your life. How do you feel like your paradigm has changed over time and experience about marriage and creating better relationships as you started this book? Yeah. You know, than you had before. Well, I, I definitely went into marriage thinking that I was ready to love and be a giver and that we were going to have a great marriage. <laughs> and I didn't realize how self-focused I really was. <laughs> um, so there's been a huge transformation in me. Even like, as you said, when you write a book like this, it's really about continuing to grow yourself in your marriage. Like it brought to light again, things that we needed to revisit for ourselves in our marriage. How are we communicating? Like, are we just getting a little bit lazy? You know, Guy wrote a chapter in there about when you need to be friends. Like I'd, I'd encourage readers to just listen for a minute and think for a minute about, you know, what qualities do you appreciate about a friendship? And do you and your spouse have those qualities? Is your marriage one where you would say, we are such good friends. It's not that we're lovers. It's not that we're relationally or romantically connected, but are you even just friends? And for Guy and I, for a long time, we weren't friends. Like we were committed to each other, but we weren't very friendly with each other. And that was a, a big wake up call for us when we realized that just, we weren't even doing things that you do to foster a friendship with a friend. And so we knew we needed to make a plan. It's one thing to kind of know that in your head. It's a different thing to then say, well, what are we going to do about it? And that's what we try to do in the book is to then give some of those helpful suggestions of what people can actually do. But Guy and I are much better friends. I mean, we're best friends in so many ways now, even just from writing this book together. You know, one of the other chapters is about when you don't have a vision for your marriage. You know, some of us are married. We just let one day go to the next. But are you dreaming together? Are you at a place where you can be dreamers and set goals? Like, is there a personal goal you'd love to accomplish between now and next year? Is there a goal for your family that you'd love to accomplish between now and next year? Are you thinking about those things? Are you taking time to build your friendship and to dream together? Are you making a couple hours together once a week at least a way for you guys to have that friendship? Guy and I get up very early in the morning and we have coffee together and we talk and we dream and we plan and that helps our friendship. So a lot of times it's really, those are things that we never did early on. And so we were just constantly living in the aftermath of conflict because we weren't actually building time and space into our relationship to be friends and to communicate and to dream together. So we've changed a lot, but we have a long way to go. We'll both tell you, we've definitely had a lot of shifts in our thinking and in how we take care of our relationship. But I think until the day you die, there's <laughs> always going to be room for improvement. <laughs> I think it's interesting how we can live in the same household and not end up being friends. Right. Um, like you said, if it doesn't end up being an intentional thing, that can easily happen. And the fact of dreaming together, I mean, if you think about that, that's why maybe at least for my spouse and I, you know, when we began our relationship, there was a lot of dreaming. We're in 25 years now. And I think that I feel that, you know, I, that's a chastisement of myself that, mm. that maybe we're not doing enough dreaming, you know, reality sets in <laughs> yes, <laughs> and you stop does. that dreaming, but that's what makes relationships exciting. And you think about those friendships that you have with other people. One of the reasons why you're friends is that you tell each other things that you wouldn't necessarily share with another person right. because you trust them. But that ends up happening a lot in marriages where we, it ends up being a fight maybe. And so you no longer yeah. talk about those places where you feel frustrated or vulnerable or hurt yeah. or anything like that. Yeah. And in that chapter in marriage triggers, that's why we like, we say, okay, here's something you can do. Like make a date for seven days, you know, from mm -hmm. now where you're just, you are going to get up in the morning and have coffee together. And between now and then say to each other, let's list 
two things we'd each like to do within a year, personally and for our family or our marriage, and then two things for five years and two things for 10 years and just write it out and then just come together over coffee and compare notes. And then we get our calendars out and we start putting some action steps in place to make that happen. You know, if we're not intentional, if we're not proactive, then our dreams are going to just lay dormant and the friendship's going to, you know, become dormant. So it's really important to really move to action <laughs> and to, <laughs> you know, it's sometimes you need a nudge. Sometimes you need a book like this to just give you some ideas and, and you can make them your own, but to start thinking more creatively about ways that you can continue to foster a better relationship with your spouse. I definitely agree. Like I said, so many points, even being married like a long time, like I have been, that you start to realize that you're not keeping up on some of those things that are super important. I think it's interesting too, like often we have our own individual dream and we never check in with our spouse to see how that fits in with like the marriage dream yes. or the family dream, you know, um, so true. and that's where I see maybe marriage is separated is that they both have individual goals, but no goals together. Other. Right. That was very interesting that you said that. I think like, do you feel like maybe three points that you want to, you know, share about what you hope the readers get from your book? Maybe common problems that you've seen or ways to make simple corrections um, that we can start doing maybe today. Yeah, well, I definitely think that communication is sort of foundational to all of these triggers, right? How mm -hmm. we communicate and being able to do that well. And so we hope that when readers read this book, one thing is that they do feel hopeful. We want them to feel hopeful that it's possible for improvement and for change. I'm telling you, if it was possible for Guy and I to make progress and to have a marriage that was strong and where we could become friends and dream together and really handle these triggered moments in a way that would bless each other instead of just constantly reacting to each other, then it's possible for anybody. And so we hope they come away with the hope of that for themselves. We also want them to be inspired. You know, so often our triggers and our challenges, they suck the joy and the life out of our relationship and our home, right? We start to take each other for granted. We start to become bitter. And just the joy of who we are as a couple erodes very easily. And so we're hoping that this book will just start to inspire people that it doesn't have to be that way. Tomorrow doesn't have to look like yesterday. We can actually do something today that's going to make an impact and start to change the trajectory of our relationship. And so we hope that the ideas that we put in each of these 31 chapters inspire people. And then you know, thirdly, we do see that communication is one of the biggest issues for people. And so for Guy and I, we recognize that it can be really challenging <laughs> when one spouse maybe wants to be communicating and working on these issues and the other does not. But we hope that in most cases, a lot of us need to just remember that we're on the same team. And so teammates do communicate with each other, right? We all know what our role is, what our place is. Sometimes we play different roles on a team, but we're all, you know, have a very similar common goal that we're trying to reach. And so we hope that people come away from this book being better communicators and recognizing that you're a team. So that communication doesn't have to get nasty. It doesn't have to become where you know, one person is dominant and the other. It doesn't have to be something that is fractured in any way. That There's really practical things you can do to communicate in a way where you are a team and it's very positive and you move in the right direction. And we really feel like this book is, is one where a lot of the issues, though they're common among so many people, that it will speak uniquely to you in your own situation because every couple is unique and different. And yet we really pray that though there are these common things that a lot of us struggle with, you will be able to take it and make it fit your specific relationship and that you will embrace that and look forward to that, that this is not a situation where you know, you, you're going to read a book and it's kind of maybe applies to some people, maybe doesn't, or it's not going to, you know, fit your specific situation. We really hope that everybody comes away feeling blessed. And it's been so encouraging to see that true, um, as we've heard from so many readers all around the world in different stages and situations that it's been a real blessing to them. 
That's awesome. And I'm going to get to feedback, but just to kind of follow up on different things that you talked about. So with the communication, um, one of the things that I love about your book, um, you know, if we just take that, uh, the driving triggers, so the backseat driving triggers, for example, I appreciated the fact like one of the things, and, and I feel like maybe as a couple, if you read this book together, or you might just want to point out a chapter to your spouse and say, I love how in particular in that chapter, he's like, well, maybe she's thinking, this and maybe yes. he's thinking that I think those are good things to go are you thinking that you know to ask your spouse right. that what are you thinking if you're not thinking that then what are you thinking I think asking those questions and and understanding that background to it is super yeah. important of, yes I mean that, that you, clarity <laughs> yeah you may yeah. see your spouse just yelling at you know seeing them be this backseat driver but there's always some underlying issue of maybe why you know, they're yeah. feeling so passionate about that situation. So that yeah, Guy Guy was really, you know, it was so encouraging to me for him to, for us to sit down and recognize, like he listened when I said, okay, the real issue, because I'm the backseat driver <laughs> in our marriage, <laughs> the reason that I'm panicky like this is because, you know, we have, we have a, a new baby in the car. And so as a mom, my nurturing spirit is wanting control of the situation. It feels out of control. So I'm trying to control it. Mm -hmm. And I'm feeling a little fearful and anxious about this new baby in this vehicle. And maybe those aren't even wrong, you know, right things to be thinking or worried about. You know, they're not even really valid. Guy's a great driver. He's never had a car accident. Like <laughs> he's not giving me any reason to question him. But for him, it was like personal, like she's criticizing me. Yeah. And I was like, honey, it's really not at all that I'm criticizing you. These are my own issues that I'm dealing with. And so guess what? He could respond with compassion and empathy instead of irritation. Mm -hmm. And so we try to allow opportunities for people to think differently about our spouse. Sometimes we make our spouse into the bad guy in the middle of the trigger, as opposed to thinking, okay, what might really be going on here? And how can we work together to no longer make this a trigger, but make everybody feel better about the situation? I mean, imagine if we did that on a regular basis, where we always started out first believing the best about our spouse. Mm -hmm. And we started thinking, what's really the underlying root here and how can we communicate and dig this out and then make a plan so that this isn't something where we're fighting all the time. That's I think awesome. our marriages would yeah. be deeply transformed. Exactly. Well, and the other thing that you touched on earlier, you know, with those three points, you know, that we're on the same team, but oftentimes in marriage, we find ourselves having power struggles. And maybe that is because of that desiring that sense of control. Like when you become a relationship with two people, sometimes you lose control of being the person in charge all the time. Does that make mm -hmm. sense? Like, you know, what was your feeling about that? You know, how do we eliminate those power struggles or wanting that control in that relationship? Yeah. And I think this is really a unique thing for each couple because some people they really are more of a follower and they like having a strong leader in the house and they're married to a strong leader and that person kind of does their thing and the other spouse falls along and they're content to do that and it works for them. And so that's fine. But sometimes we launch into these roles and we just kind of blindly go along, not realizing that our other spouse isn't okay with that. And that's why across the board, Guy and I advocate having these little meetings, just a little you know, family meeting um, with each other every so often, preferably weekly, but even twice a month where you know the purpose of that meeting is to come together and just kind of evaluate where are you at. It's like a little temperature check for your marriage relationship. And we just say, hey, for Guy and I, it's almost always having a coffee on a Saturday morning or hiring a sitter for a couple hours on a Sunday afternoon or whatever, where we just know this is going to be the time where if there's something that's kind of bugging me, you know, I think a lot of us especially as women, we have a very difficult time voicing our concerns or our struggles with our spouses. And so it's really important for both of you to say, you know what, this is a time where we can, we agree, we're not going to get angry or upset. We're going to really listen as our spouse speaks to us in a way that is just demonstrating their concern. So if it's this leadership role, there's a power struggle, you come together and you just say, look, this power struggle thing is a problem. I want our relationship to be better. I know that you want our relationship to be better. So let's talk about this and problem solve together to make it better. And it's not that anybody's necessarily doing something wrong. We just need to work on a different way of communicating or handling tasks around the house 
or how we make decisions, can we start to maybe be a little bit more like a team? Like, what are some of the things you like making decisions about? Spouse, okay, let's write them out, you know? Okay, here's some of the things I would like to be making decisions about. Or I really don't wanna make decisions about, you know, the groceries and doing all of the food prep and meal planning. But maybe your spouse always does that and you'd like to do more of that. Is this something that we could do together more? Could we kind of divide and conquer? And so really it's about communicating all of those kinds of things. Like what is working for you? What is not? We have to be able to lovingly voice those concerns and those issues that are rooted in our hearts. And we have to be open to hearing our spouse do it, you know, communicate that with us. And then to really be flexible because a marriage, you've got your personality, your dreams, your background, Mm -hmm. your strengths, your gifts, and your spouse has all of theirs. And so until you were married, those were yours alone. And that served you well in the world. But when you got married, your unique personality, strengths, gifts, and whatnot, your spouse's unique personality, strengths, and gifts, and whatnot, now have combined to make your own marriage personality and unique strengths and whatnot. So you have to think of yourselves not as this autonomous person anymore, but as someone who does collaborate with your spouse. You've been made one. You're like one person now. So you have to come together regularly to communicate and talk these things through and be open-minded toward one another. And also to have that spirit we talked about at the very beginning, being willing to refresh your spouse, being willing to bless your spouse, being willing to compromise in some areas because you want your marriage to be the best that it can be. Hopefully every couple wants that. That's why you married each other in the first place. I love that. Well, and that's really an important point, I think, to pick at is that this is a book about marriage. Um, Maybe asking ourselves why we even got married, because in our world today, you know, there's a lot of people that don't take that step forward to get married. And, you know, when I was thinking about those power struggles, I was thinking about, I think in this day and age, that's even more prevalent to have these power struggles because, you know, as women in particularly, you know, the whole feminism thing, we want a voice. We want to be a person who has a part in our marriage to make the decisions for the family, that kind of thing. But at the same time, if we don't give up that sense of control to some extent and want to work together with our spouse, we will find ourselves not married <laughs> because, because it just doesn't work in, in a marriage. And, and the crazy thing is like, I'm totally speaking about myself here, but mm-hmm. you know, I want to make those, that sense of control. And sometimes I, I take that away from my spouse, but then at the same time, then I'm like critical, like I wish you'd step up, you know, <laughs> you do right. but, but I've also, I'm like, what was my part in that, you know, type of thing. So mm-hmm. I think it's important yeah. to recognize that for sure. Yeah. And I agree with you that, that there is a sense, I think today's couples, definitely there's more of a teamwork mentality and a, a partnership, like a true, more of an equal partnership in the tasks of life, in being with your family. I mean, my husband does the dishes. I mean, I don't really ever think my dad did dishes growing up, Um, but my, my husband does all the dishes. I do all the laundry. Like we definitely divide the tasks around the house, you know, we are much more open to things being a little bit different generationally, even than they used to be in this day and age, because times have changed. And it doesn't mean that the Bible is irrelevant. That doesn't mean that it just means that we need to be better communicators about thinking about our roles a little bit differently. And if something's not working for us, it doesn't have to look like the generation before us. It can look different and still be really, really good but we have to identify those areas. Or even better. In, or in, I better. Think, yeah. I 100% think it's better <laughs> um, to move towards a, a model where our roles are not so traditionally defined culturally because a lot of the things that we do in our marriages are cultural norms. They're not necessarily biblical norms. And so it's really important to recognize that and then to say, yeah, I could be open to helping out with more things around the house. You know, I could be more willing to change more diapers. I could be more willing, you know, to change the oil in the car to learn how to do that. Like those are not things in in the Bible that say you can or cannot do this. It's just a matter of what are you and your spouse comfortable with and making that clear and then supporting each other in those different roles, as opposed to just feeling resentful, like, oh, he's supposed to do this. I'm supposed to do this. She's supposed to do that. And then never really communicating about it, just feeling resentful or bitter about it 
or frustrated that you can't participate, you know, have those conversations. It's really funny. My husband and I, because we run a business together in production, we will often go to events where we are at a, um, a movie premiere or we're at a dinner or some such thing. And it's a pretty male dominated industry, the Hollywood industry. It's changing, but it's still typically that way. Mm -hmm. And so because Guy and I are a team in many things and we're equal partners in our company, a couple of times it'll be that, you know, they're starting to seat everybody at the table for dinners. And a lot of the industry people that we're with will bring their spouses. And it's usually the men that are the industry guys, and then they bring their wives. And a couple of times in a row, I ended up getting seated at the end of the table with a lot of the wives, which was great. I love talking with women, but I kept, you know, we were just talking about kids and family and all that, which I also love talking about, but I kept hearing all these little industry thing conversations happening at the other end of the table. (laughs) And I, I was just dying because I was actually literally like blocked in my chair. I couldn't even get up and go around to like (laughs) try to be a part of those conversations, but it was killing me because there were these two very distinct conversations going on at different ends of the table. And while I would have enjoyed both, I really wanted to be at the other end. And my husband, he caught my eye and he knew. He was like, he knew my heart, what my desire was, that I really wanted to be talking about what was going on with the Hollywood stuff at the other end of the table, not just the other conversations that the women were having, which I, I, again, I'm not putting that down. He just knew me. Mm -hmm. He knew what our marriage looked like. He knew the things that I like to talk about and that I would have loved to also been a part of some of those conversations. So you do have to just be really, really mindful (laughs) of your own spouse and what they love and appreciate. And thankfully my husband has been very careful to draw me into more of the kinds of conversations that, that I really enjoy (laughs) when we go to these events. Yeah. That's great. Well, let's move on to some feedback that you've received about your book. Now, we have talked about this is a, you know, it's gentle biblical responses, but do you feel like that a person who isn't necessarily religious can still get some great insight out of this book? Absolutely. We really target this book to all audiences. We were very, very careful. I mean, we, we include a lot of proverbs and wisdom and, and things like that from the Bible, but this is really very, very practical. <laughs> There's a lot of information in there that are just the way that you can communicate with each other, different things you can say and do that are going to cause you and your spouse to not just react in anger or frustration, but to start thinking differently about how you can respond in that moment so that we're not adding fuel to the flame. Mm -hmm. And so there's a a lot of content in here that, and we actually hear from readers all the time who are from many different kinds of faith who are really encouraged and helped practically by our books. That's true for all the books I've written. So that's a joy to us as well. Well, and I did have a friend point out to me long ago that sometimes when we think we're not religious, we end up acting a lot more like Christ than we believe because we're all affected by Uh, um, that religion of Christianity. I mean, if we're looking at the Black Lives Matters movement that's going on now, I think that that's why it's hitting our hearts so much is that a lot of us are a lot more cued into how Christ would behave than we were before. That that story of his life continues to have power in our lives regardless of if we admit it or not, <laughs> you know, so, so, so but true. I, I definitely mm-hmm. wanted to ask you that. And I really do feel like I'm a religious person, but I wouldn't say that I'm like, I'm not super into like Christian books or whatever. I'm into just, right. you know, learning more about, mm-hmm. and I do feel like there's, even in some of the prayers that you guys do and at some of the end, ends of the chapters, I actually feel like I get more out of those because yeah. uh, you touch on things in those prayers that help you have a lot more empathy for right. the spouse or the other person. Yes. And those are also very great places to Uh, look at those questions and then ask your spouse, you know, is this a place where you feel like you could have some power in your life? Absolutely. And really, I think a lot of, you know, what we're talking about in this book, even things that relate to the Bible that we use, we're really talking about ways to, to love other people well. Right. Mm -hmm. And that I think is a common desire for so many people of many different kinds of faith and religion is that we all want to love people well, and we want to be better versions of ourselves. And so that's, again, just practically what we try to motivate people towards in the chapters of this book. And so hopefully it will be, and actually our publisher is a very 
large you know, secular publisher, Simon & Schuster. So, you know, they saw the value in this book as well and really wanted it to be for mainstream audiences. That's awesome. Well, if we talk about um, wanting to improve those relationships, what do you feel like is something that you've learned that can cause our relationships to be more meaningful, but then also more impactful to our own personal life's mission? Because even though like you and your spouse, you may be doing a business together, you both have, I think that I feel like as when we come here as people to this earth, that we all have a life's mission. And even though we may be married, we still have the right to have our own individual life's mission. Does that make sense? Like, but how can we create relationships that help us, you know, better fulfill those yeah. missions? Yeah, I think that whenever we're in an environment or in a relationship that is taxing or feels angry or there's a lot of frustration, it weighs us down in other areas of our lives, right? Like when things aren't good between my husband and I, it colors the other things I'm trying to do. And because when you're married, your spouse is, you know, they're in your home, you're around them hopefully quite a bit. You know, a lot of the decisions that you make, especially if you have children, your lives are very much intertwined. And so if there are difficulties there, it's going to rob you of joy and inspiration and creativity and motivation and even hope in other areas of your life. So it's in our best interest to make the most of these very intimate relationships that we're involved in. And so we hope that people will allow this book to improve their marriages to an extent that that really ends up trickling into other areas of their lives. You know, when I talked earlier about Guy and I losing weight, like we both knew <laughs> that this was another area. Like I wanted to start running again. I wanted to be more active again. One of my biggest complaints for myself was that I just ran out of energy with my kids. So when Guy and I started thinking about how can we do this together, it was an even bigger motivator to keep going and to get healthy because we got to do that together. That was a positive thing, a positive goal that we decided to do together. And it's impacted our lives radically. I mean, we were able to get off medications, you know, our awesome. we sleep better. I mean, so much of it, but it would have been, I think, more challenging. I think I could have done it without him doing it with me. But to know that I had this partner who was going to get healthy with me, and because we had a healthy relationship, we still have our ups and downs, but because our relationship is in such a better place today than it was even five years ago, we were able to actually get healthy in other areas of our lives, like nutritionally. Yeah. <laughs> so there's a definite connection there. And, and we hope that, that this is really just the starting point for a lot of incredible relationships and dreams and creative endeavors that couples can do together. Well, and I agree with that. When you were talking and we were talking about being on the same team, sometimes teammates will sabotage each other. And that can happen a lot in a relationship. And when we talk about those power struggles sometimes, and, and we may do that kind of thing, not really realizing that we're sabotaging right. the other person, but it can, like I said, it plays into that power struggle. And right. uh, you see this a lot when couples want to lose weight. You know, I can't remember who, who talked about it, but they talked about sometimes when a partner gets healthy, it makes the other person have to do that, right. that maybe they don't yes. want to. So they'll sabotage that situation. Yes. So yeah, I'm, I'm actually writing a new project related to this. And that is one of the chapters that I focus on is sabotage. And, mm -hmm. and a lot of times we think, no, they're not trying to sabotage us. And they're probably not laying awake at night, you know, like, yeah. ha, ha, how can I <laughs> sabotage you? But they will do and say things that do sabotage you mainly because when you start to turn your life around, the sad truth is not everybody is comforted by that. Not everybody thinks, wow, that's amazing. I'm so purely happy for you. Sometimes it just convicts them. They're like, well, I'm, what's wrong with me? Why am yeah. I not doing that? And so it's this internal like voice that we have for ourselves that I'm not good enough. I'm not as good as that. I can't do that. And th those are all, I think, lies we tell ourselves that we're not capable. So other people's success tends to threaten us instead of, motivate us and inspire us towards our own. Yeah. And so it's a very real thing. And uh, we'll have to do another podcast, Rebecca, to talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> I know, because that, that would be a, a thing I'd love to talk about. Because when we talk about wanting to live that life's mission, and if we don't have that good relationship in our lives, we may struggle ever living our life's mission because right. of that sabotage. For I sure. totally agree. Yeah. Totally agree. Yep. 
Well, tell me, we've talked a little bit about humility being a key piece, but what are some habits do you feel like would be really helpful for people if they're wanting better relationships? Um, Yeah, man, get out your calendars now and set that time to have those healthy communication, you know, meetings, quote unquote, Mm -hmm. with your spouse. I mean, go walk along the beach if you can, you know, go roller skating, like do something (laughs) that just also builds friendship, you know, do that for an hour and then take an hour to be like, okay. Now let's talk about some of these things and be open-minded, like I said, but do something even today, like call your spouse, send them a text, get the calendar out, make a time. Even if you've got kids around and you can't get a sitter or whatever, maybe it's dinner picnic on the lawn, you know, tonight doing something that's just out of the norm that you would do with a friend, you know, so do something where you're doing something specifically to build a friendship, think creatively, get outside of your rut of that cycle of anger, frustration, same old thing, same old arguments, do something different to disrupt that pattern. And then, yeah. And then also like make a separate time if need be, but where you, you agree ahead of time, Hey, this is also going to be a time where we get to just take one thing or two. We're not going to like go through 31 trigger issues in one (laughs) session. That would be overwhelming for anybody, but take one thing that's really on your heart. That's a really present issue. That is a stumbling block in your relationship with your spouse and be open-minded and agree to talk it through and get to work to the root of it together and then make a plan so that when that trigger arises, you're not reacting, you're responding. And maybe it's some of the things that we say in the book, like we even give you some sort of script type things that you can use to have those conversations so that they're not accusatory or Mm -hmm. threatening, but that you're disarming one another when you're having those conversations, which we think is really important. So use your vulnerable situations to help offset your own vulnerability, I think is really a a powerful message. Like sometimes when we can put in somebody else's story, it can open up our spouses or our, you know, friendships eyes so that they might see something from a different angle. Do you know what I mean? Instead of feeling like they're being attacked. Totally. Yeah. And be patient with this process, right? Like we didn't get to where we are probably overnight if we're feeling like our marriage is strained. So it's not going to happen overnight that it's going to be radically different, but you'd be surprised how even a small change like this, a small disruption can really have a big positive impact, but be patient with the process. You know, you're two people coming together Um, with a lot of history, most likely. And so allow this new history to take shape, you know, one moment at a time as well. I love that. And, you know, I've read in the past that, uh, I think it's a study, and I wish maybe you can, if I tell you, maybe you can tell me where I can find it, but that if people divorce or if they don't divorce, usually five years later, they're actually glad they didn't. And then sometimes if we do divorce, sometimes in five years, we're Mm -hmm. actually regretting that fact. Yeah. I wonder sometimes if that's why people that have divorced are constantly like bringing up the garbage of the, about mm-hmm. that other person so that they feel a little more and hopefully justified in it. Yeah, justified. <laughs> yeah. And I, I don't want anyone thinking that I'm like belittling them because, sure. because I'm sure I have listeners that are divorced, but we want to do everything we possibly can to, you know, strengthen and um, help those relationships um, as possible. Yes. I mean, yeah, absolutely. And th- there, I've heard that too. And actually, I really think that there is a time and a place for divorce. You know, Mm that there is there and we don't want anybody to feel like, okay, well I'm divorced. So I failed or I did the wrong thing or whatever that, that may not be the case. And so, but we always feel like there's a, an opportunity as long, as long as you are a couple where, like I said, you know, you're, it's all these little things that are kind of adding up. We want to get to you before we're at that breaking point. And even if you are at a really crisis moment, we think there's a lot of value in this book that's going to help you. But we do agree that there is, I think, first step would be, let's try some of these things that we can do to better communicate, to establish our roles a little bit more equally, to think about ways that we talk to each other when we feel triggered what can we do differently to think of ourselves more as a team? How could I, like I would fight till I was all out of complete steam and then then some in order to try to make my marriage work because I especially was mindful of my children. I didn't want a broken family. And so I really was like, all right, I've got to completely think differently about this relationship and I'm going to do everything I can before I cut the cord. And so we committed to doing that. And we're one of those marriages where 
where we made it, you know, and so we want people to have hope for that and to be encouraged that that's a possibility for them as well. And yet at the same time, we recognize that there are some marriages that are so deeply in crisis that it's going to require some more professional help. And there are some times when it's just not the plan. Um, It's not the best thing for you or your children, especially in an abusive situation where you should not be in that relationship. So we recognize that fully. And yet there's hope for the future, even after that. That's awesome. And that's all I kind of wanted to get to, too, is that we want to give it everything we possibly can. We don't ever want to have a regret. You know, I wish I would have done this or that. And so I love the idea that this is a help for that. And then, like I said, if it comes to the other thing, at least there's been, you know, you've made every effort. Yes. Um, Yeah. And you can rest in that and be at peace in that. Yeah. Yeah. So what a fun conversation. Do you want to give us some parting advice for our listeners and then give us your contact information, how we can get in touch with you? Sure. So I would just say, you know what? Seek ways today just to outdo your spouse in (laughs) showing them love and honor, like outdo it, make it a contest. I know that sometimes when you're hurting and angry, there's a lot of frustration. You're like, that sounds dumb. Um, I don't want to do that. Like I don't even, I'm not even in that place, but I would just challenge you, like look for a way that you can outdo your spouse and showing them honor and loving kindness. And then just be open-minded to what the reception is of that. Maybe they'll, it'll be well-received. Maybe it won't. It doesn't matter. This is an opportunity for you to water your spouse. So that would be my advice to you today, practically speaking. You know your spouse. You know there's something that you could do for them that would just demonstrate that you're their friend and that you're their spouse and that you do love and care for them. And I'd encourage you to make that happen in 24 hours. And then you can find me on social media, on Instagram. I have an author Facebook page as well, Amber Leah, L-I-A. And I'm also, my blog is Mother of Knights because I have four little boys. They're my little knights, K-N-I-G-H-T-S. And then Guy and I are also health coaches. So if people are looking to get healthy, we love people joining us on our journey. You can um, reach out to me um, on social media and message me anytime. And we also have my co-author and I, Wendy, if you're interested in more gentle parenting practices, we have a private Facebook group called Gentle Parenting with Amber and Wendy that you can request to join and um, get some help there too. That's awesome. Again, we've been chatting with Amber Leah. She's the co-author with her husband, Guy, of the book, Marriage Triggers. I highly recommend it. Like I said, there's so much great information there. And then we want to do everything that we possibly can to strengthen those relationships just for anything better than you're living your own life's mission. You're being a good example to your children. And then you're providing a, a good, safe, solid home for them for sure anything we can do to increase those relationships. But thank you so much, Amber, for coming on and talking to us about these important topics. Hopefully we have you back on to talk about health coaching as well. I appreciate that. That sounds good. Thank you, Rebecca. You're one of my favorite people to do interviews with. I love your podcast. Thank you so much for having me on. Thank you for listening to The Luminous Mind. Music featured in this episode from Scott Holmes. To learn more about our podcast, check us out at theluminousmind.net.